<clears throat> Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to uh, our humble office. Actually, um, this is like a one of like on the office that we have. We also have another one at 11th floor, and that's why uh, we plan to hire many more. Uh, just a brief of introductions. My name is Didi, Didi Ahmadi. You can call me Didi. Uh, I work as engineering manager here. So I'm overseeing like a uh, few teams. First is the cloud infrastructures, security, and then uh, data engineering tools, and also um, data engineer, which interface with a bunch of business uh, across the Traveloka, ranging from whatever products that we have. <coughs> So um, previously, I worked at a visual effect company. They make movie. I mean, uh, like Star Wars and something like that. It's, it's called Lucasfilm. Uh, I'm dealing a lot with infrastructures right now. Um, I work used. To, I used to work with a uh, telco and some sort of healthcare as well. It's my. I think it's my 12th year in Singapore. So time flies, I guess. Uh, yes. The subject here is our journeys. I mean, the title is changing a bit, I guess. Yeah. It used to be. What? Battle stories? Battle stories on productizing Spark at Traveloka. The main reason we chose battle story because like it's not everything is uh, sunshine and rainbow. Right? The main reason we're thinking to have this kind of like, let's call it sharing sessions because we face a lot of interesting things. And um, some of them definitely not fun things and we would expect people to learn from our mistakes. That's the things. So it's not about fancy stuff. It might be fancy. I mean, you guys decide whether it's fancy or not. But we're going to start with that. Next, please. So uh, <clears throat> this is the spark that you, you guess that we have right now. We do have data processing, which is EDL, I guess. The second thing is data exploration. I'm trying to make it simple here, because everything can be lumped together into these two things. And then uh, we start from 2016, not 2017, I guess. Um, there's going to be slide explaining more about the tech stack, what happened on 2016. We start with self-managed Spark clusters. I mean, how many of you ever set up and manage self-managed production Spark cluster on your own? Cool. One, two. How fun was it? It was not fun. <laughs> Precisely, right? OK, cool. So it wasn't fun, but uh, why did we do that? Because I think that was the best option ha happened at that time. And we're just curious, and of course, it's not fun. We will explain more why it's not fun. And then uh, we choose to introduce a, a bit of EMR here for a certain back feeling and something like that. But the overall stack is the same. And then um, <clears throat> by 2018, mm, a number of our data is ready on the GCP. So we choose, like, OK, what's next? Because uh, okay, most of these here are in AWS, I guess. And, Allah, and then we're still using AWS for a number of use cases but a bunch of our stacks already on the GCP on this part. So we decided to uh, move a number of them into a data box. I mean, this is our code name, TT. I mean, we do have our own internal code name, but uh, we prefer not to share it for now, I guess, because I think what we're planning to explain in detail is about this, the pain points. We're not going to talk about this too much because it's pretty easy, I guess. And how we can transition here is easily, seamlessly, including the customizations. For example, we have hundreds of jobs. How to change one line of code, and then you can change everything from here to here without problems. We do the flip within one day or something like that. Just change it, and then pep, 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 everything's settled, sent to here. We do have a number of like Kubel instance here being used for many things, but Kubel is not just for Spark, but because these things we're going to discuss just for Sparks. We still have a Kubel instance, a number of things until now. We still have a Databricks instance here for now. And something that I need to mention is when a certain company organization screw, you cannot just leverage the existing use case. I've mentioned like a few people. You need to customize it a certain way. You need to build a certain features. You need to build a wrapper on top of it. You need to build orchestrations. That's something that basically we're going to talk about this. Even though, for example, oh, yeah, self-manage. You just need to run it, right? No. You need to optimize it. You need to build something to ensure that basically it's suitable with your use case. And then uh, we do have another code name, RS and Dataprox, basically general Spark submissions in the Google, which is like uh, schedulers and then key management and then uh, anything in between. So basically, 
it's not as fancy as kind of like a click and go, just like Qball and Databricks perhaps, but it serves a certain use case. 70, 80% is good enough for us because it cater for a certain use case as well. It's not just catering for everyone, but cater for a certain specific set of engineer with a certain skill sets. Okay, um, I don't want to like uh, talk too much because like a lot of details gonna be uh, presented by Nisrina and Andre as well. And I need to breakfast thing. So basically, the next session is gonna be on Nisrina, I guess. There you go. Okay, hi, uh, my name is Denise Rina, and thank you all for coming. Um, I'm gonna be, oh no, it's fine. Um, yeah, I'm gonna begin by talking about the ETL part of, uh, of Spark. Um, and uh, this is, um, just to give you a bit of background, this is how our pipeline looked like maybe around 2016, so not, no big data test stock test stack at all. Um, like most all of our data, tracking data, production data, everything it's in is in MongoDB sharded or either sharded or just read replicas. And our ETL, our vanilla Python code, just running off of one node, or like one gigantic node that we keep upgrading. Um, yeah, so that obviously does uh, scale out very uh, pretty well. And um, that's where we where Spark and all of its friends come from. Uh, we kind of need uh, something that scales horizontally really well. And uh, as a processing platform, Spark is what we choose because, well, it scales really well. Um, there are a lot of, um, you know, uh, Python uh, at the time was also uh, like a big reason why we choose Spark because that's a language that a lot of our data engineers are familiar with. Okay, next. And the for the first iteration, it's uh, it's simply a single size fixed uh, fixed size cluster. So it was um, we didn't start off having it this big. It was it was like I think at the end about twenty something R three to X large EC two nodes. That was around like that was one terabyte something memory. Um, we're using high availability mode. Uh, we don't use uh, at the beginning. We don't use high availability mode. High availability mode. It was just one node, and then like a few accidents later, yeah, we decided to yeah we we need failover. Um, some ancillaries, uh, so three zookeeper nodes to support the HA mode, and like one separate node for for timeline server. Um, what else? Right, HTTP distribution, uh, Horton works, uh, provisioned with Ambari and some Ansible playbook. So the provisioning part is pretty. Um, is, is one thing that we work on a lot because the Ansible playbook is because we want things to be reproducible and Ansible is what a lot of uh, other engineers are using in our organization. The Ambari part is specifically for the Hadoop stack because um, yeah, we, we first try to write some Ansible role to install Spark and things, but it's, it's just complicated. And yeah, uh, so we're running around 250 something ETL uh, mostly runtime in a few minutes to a few hours, so they're not very big jobs. They're kind of medium sized, maybe in the ten minutes to three, two to three hours runtime. Um, we're running Spark version one point six, so still mostly RDD. Okay, so yeah, you you've probably seen this diagram like a hundred times before. If you're familiar with Spark, just your usual setup of like two master and then some zookeepers and those Spark cores that we keep scaling out as uh, we need it. And this is maybe what uh, we're using Airflow to schedule jobs. And uh, because we're running Spark Submit from this uh, nodes here, we're installing Spark Client here too. So Spark Submit is running locally in here. And yeah, so that, th those nodes are pretty, this is where we release, um, where we release scripts. Uh, those nodes are yeah pr pretty static. That one's kind of keep growing as we need to, just to give a background. Okay. All right, so uh, again, I think I wanna share wh what's interesting is the, is the provisioning part. Uh, the, the Spark cluster configuration is mostly vanilla with several configuration we made. And 
yeah, this is how we kind of mix Ansible and Ambari for, for, for provisioning. So generally we have four uh, Ansible playbook for each node type. Node type is those, so for example, the Spark worker is one node type, the Spark master is one node type, the zookeeper is one node type, the airflow worker is one node type. So for each of those, we built like this, we usually create like this four uh, playbooks that uh, define different things. We, we tend to uniformly do it this way just for you know, uniformity and other people who are working on, you can have like other people who are familiar with this kind of format. Uh, working on working on it together. So the first thing we define is the resources. Uh, what are this? Let's say I'm having uh, my my airflow worker. What are they? What are the node types? What are the volumes? How am I gonna mount the volumes? Things like that. That was one playbook. And then the VPC rules. And this is also kind of important because we separated our nodes into VPCs uh, in AWS. This define. There's like one playbook that defines solely. Uh, inbound outbound rules. So for example, a worker node can only expose port something to a master node. Um, and yeah, th this kind of relationship. Um, and then the, def the software provisioning. This is where we, you know, if we have like pip install spark, we would put it, just put it there, but uh, we don't. So like other pip libraries, uh, other, um, yeah, other, other pip libraries that we use for transformation, they're installed in this, um, yeah, in this in this playbook, and then the fourth one is the monitoring rules. They're usually there's we're using since we're using Datadog for monitoring. It's mostly just Datadog checks, and the Ambari part is to provision the Hadoop uh, stack and your Hadoop stack and that's supposed to be Spark Hadoop stack and Spark, um, like to complement this number three there. Oh, yeah, just this is a screenshot of one of our Ansible. Um, playbook for for provisioning. So it's like, yeah, install I don't know, PyMongo, cryptography, PyCountry, things like that. Those are just a list of things to ins uh, that we install. So that whenever we're adding a new nodes, we can just run this run this playbook and it's reproducible. And the user uh, submits uh, the script via Airflow operator. So they write. Uh, so when they want to like write an ETL, first they write the Spark portion of thing, like the one that actually, uh, that actually contains the processing logic. And then they schedule it uh, via Airflow. And air, the Airflow in our team, they're used for a lot of, to orchestrate a lot of other things. So for example, after you're running your Spark job, you're writing it to S3 and then um, from S3, you're loading it to Redshift or some other place. So yeah, this is just one part of the entire pipeline. We're creating a custom uh, operator. It, this is this extends bash operator. If you're familiar with Airflow, you're, it, this is essentially ended up translated to a Spark submit command. So if yeah, if you see the if you see the argument, it's pretty obvious on how they translate to to a Spark submit. Like there's the master and cluster, and then you got the Spark arguments. Oh, what else? Um, yeah, we use Datadog for monitoring. We originally only used this, um, oh yeah, maybe like in a production cluster, especially if it's just one cluster, it's important to keep it alive like 24 seven. And monitoring and alerting is important. We initially only use this Ambari. Ambari got this built in kind of alerting uh, thing that you, can, that you can use, but we ended up moving to Datadog just because well, richer interface, just easier to configure things. And it has all sort of Hadoop related check that you can use and fairly convenient to use. You can just use um, very few configurations, things like uh, you can configure a few things and you can get um, various metrics from resource managers, uh, from node manager, uh, you get it streamed uh, to, to Datadoc services and then you can just build dashboard and alert on top of that. Yeah, this is what kind of our monitoring playbook look like. So yeah, for example, this is, I think it is for one of the, the master node. So we we kind of plug in the, the URI name to the Yarn um, integration, the HDFS name node, the Spark, um, I forgot, oh yeah, the Spark URI. And yeah, there are several other checks that we uh, that we kind of use. Um, for example, you want to check if your resource manager process is alive. You can just use the process checks to see if this, there's this string in your 
your usual PS aux uh, output. And TCP check, there are some several ports that we check, like, I don't know, like just manage your web UI. We keep checking if port 8088 is, um, is accepting request. Yeah, this is the, I kind of add this because this is like, yeah, th this looks way nicer than uh, what our previous dashboard looked like. So yeah, you can, you can build this kind of thing on top of, after you stream everything. Right, so um, this to, to conclude what hap um, the self-managed part. This, so it's fairly stable, it works okay, but if we can improve a few things that this is what we want to improve. Uh, so our ETL, it mostly serves dashboard and, res uh, and reports uh, that are expected by people kind of first thing in the morning they want to see in the office. So it's usually running like 2 to 8 a.m. before you know, uh, for it to, before people are, are expecting it. So it's idle most of the other time. It really is just sit there doing nothing. So lots of room for cost, for cost saving. And scaling up still require manual work. Like if we want to add nodes, that will, that will require us to like run the uh, Ansible playbook manually. And then we need to configure some things in the Ambari uh, platform manually too. That was like half a day to one day work to like really keep things um, stable. <coughs> Uh, we want more cost transparency. Like um, uh, from like a David presentation, we have many products, we have many sub teams, we have many business units, and sometimes there. Uh, sometimes you want to know exactly how much is this product uh, costing to run their ETL. Like you have this huge cluster, but you don't know who is actually taking up most of the resources, and we want that transparency. Uh, also, like upgrade version from 1.6. Um, we tried that once. We're upgrading like 1.4 to 1.6 uh, via Ambari, but that wasn't very straightforward. Lots of, yeah, lots of trial and errors, essentially. Um, less time spent on managing the operation. You have to keep uh, a cluster life for seven that come with certain cost. And so yeah, uh, conclusion, we want transient cluster. So um, yeah, just to give you an idea on how much your cluster is underutilized, this is the maximum, this is like the one terabyte memory um, capacity and this is the actual usage. So yeah, look at all those free spaces there. Um, this actually this actually does hit uh, does hit peak kind of in certain ranges. This kind of smooth it out. But it does hit hit peak but like only for a, s a short amount of time. Right, so we're moving on to transient cluster. So we sp uh, so instead of like just spark submitting to an existing cluster, we spin things up, run it, shut it down. So it should be more efficient cost wise and also uh, we did some preliminary calculation. Well, we have the, so we have the Spark argument data. So we have things like num executor. We have mem we have number of memory. We have vcores requested by each script, and then we since we use Airflow, we conveniently have the the runtime duration for each script, and we calculate kind of the what is the gigabyte hour or the vcore hour for each script, and we kind of we kind of get the idea of how much we are actually utilizing the entire cluster. And it was only twenty percent. Yeah, sure. The major work here is, <coughs> is basically on how to ensure that we are moving on the right way, and then we make some sort of like a some reasons that basically okay. Actually, by calculating the amount of the the fast amount of data that we have from airflow and any other sources, that we do some sort of like analysis crunch that numbers, we come out with this, okay, the current setup actually only used in average 20% capacity. So why not just using something like a transfer or something? Right, thank you, Master. And another one, again, doesn't have to maintain a long running cluster. So we choose, uh, so transient cluster, okay, check, uh, but which ones? We, choose, we ended up choosing data proc because one thing, it's spin up really fast, like one to two minutes uh, to spin things up. And then uh, this is like a, a kind of big reason too, because most most of our other infra are moving to GCP, and we don't want to have like half here, half there. And it's also cost effective. We kind of calculate with this, with that amount of twenty percent, how much does it cost, like actual money, and it's it's pretty good. So cost effective here is not just comparing with like a one or two solution. Try to compare with like a few products, four to five products. And we calculate everything end to ends with our users, etc. Right, right. We come out like, okay, with this, I think is the most perfect cost effective for our users. Just be mindful that this is based on our users. In case you yeah. do your own research, the number might be different, right? So <coughs> it works for us, but you guys are encouraged to try on your own. 
Yeah. Okay. Okay, this is, um, I don't know if, how do I explain this? But it's just like a general flow on how the transient um, setup work. Kind of, we first upload a script. Every time uh, you're running uh, an Airflow worker, you're uploading a script to, to a temporary GCS path because yeah because the script kind of changes sometimes so we are uploading as needed when it want to be submitted and then we create a cluster based on certain spec and after the cluster wait until the cluster is created submit it and then delete it and uh, if you remember there are some how about like some stuff that used to be in the unsible scripts things like uh you know, pip libraries that we install, jars that we have to download. They're in a common GCS bucket that is fairly static. And for pip in, for pip install specifically, we're using uh, init script in the data per cluster. So they're, yeah, so they're executed each time a cluster is spin up. Sorry, not quickly to go back on Sure. I think the main difference here between the standalone cluster is basically we need on the process number two and number four. Right, so we need to create something to create cluster based on the specs. This has to be done automatically because we need to migrate this just by like changing one and a four. We need to create some sort of translation layers to find out how much cluster spec that actually needed without people defining on their own. Nina can speak one of the details on that part. Oh, also, yeah. Question here. When yeah. you spin up data pro, uh, do you point at the central meta store? How do you, like, because it spins up an entire Hadoop cluster with Spark as a role? So, what about your meta store? What do you do with that yarn config? I mean, wouldn't it be easier just to do the Spark app itself? Or? Like um, the meta store, as in meta store is like high meta store. Oh, okay. Uh, we're we're really just spinning up uh all the spa all all the specification that you need to create a cluster is the, in that number two there. Yeah. And it, it was it, it can be turned. So we don't really store anything other than for things like logs. Yeah. They are stored in data proc. Um, what is it called? Uh, it has yeah, it, it has its own like logging so thing. Yeah, so log for j Spark job log logs they go into the data proc, mm -hmm. and for the Hive meta store there is no connection to the central Hive meta store. I know, Perfect. no connection. Also, it's uh, yep. So like in case of any kind of events or like sale or something, so you need to scale up more of the cluster because the goals of the jobs are high. How do you manage those uh, Like if I'm getting correctly, how do we manage? Right. You roll up the cluster every time, right? With mm -hmm. certain specs on the basis right. of previous analysis. That's right. But any time of like any kind of event or sale or something, at that time you need a high cluster, like you need a better cluster to manage all the jobs and loads. Right. So how do you manage those peaks in unusual peaks? Okay. So uh, we still configure each script manually. So for example, if for if like one day this particular script really need like a much bigger one then someone need to need to manually change the cluster spec um, it usually you can just use our backfill kind of code so that it's just one time and you don't have to change it like to the rest when we set this one i don't think there's an counter scale yet on the data blocks i guess it only happened recently and it's still on the data as well i guess uh, so uh, it's more towards the use case that we have, we sort of understand the workloads, but in case there's something that has to be in the search or something like that, I think with this, we still have to call configure manual. Again, the goal for this is mainly to remove, because the pain point of managing self managed clusters, they outweigh whatever they have in place. So, think of it this way. Uh, Nina is the sole person that managing that kind of things compared to other people. And she also needs to put a number of other ones. Having like a single point of failure in those manageable is definitely not good. Right. Well, we think about like, okay, how can we scale the whole operational things while still managing the overall things, and then still aligning with the strategy on these things, which is that kind of operation plans. Basically, the goal here is like, okay, we need to, for example, ease the whole manageability. And then the second thing is we need to bring the cost into like a make sense numbers. And then the third thing is basically, okay, what can we do to make sure that the transition is like a quick and fast? And then it still serves the whole purpose. This is the process that we do. Of course, after this, 
the whole, all the data engineers which is working on our instruments basically responsible for their own spark plugs. They know their local best. So we leave it with them. So basically, but at least we put some the overall things, we make sure the transition is smooth, and after that, we train them how to use this and etc. Transition is quite fast. We like it to have quite a, a lot of other bright person in the team, so here it goes. Knock on the wood, everything's still okay, I guess. Okay. <laughs> Okay, any other? Okay. Um, yeah, maybe the next part is kind of relevant to the cluster sizing. So, again, we have 350 something script. How do we make sure they're with all uh, their own configuration? So, there's already some, there's this, um, I don't know, executor memory, something, um, num executor already on, the, on, on that script uh, submission. So, how do we translate that to a cluster size that is appropriate? And. Yeah, and we want the migration to work as seamlessly as possible. We don't want to ask people to, hey, can you look at your cluster configuration and translate it uh, to your script configuration and translate it to a, to a spec, uh, to a cluster spec. And so we try to automate uh, things. And this is uh, how uh, kind of we do it. So again, we have the Spark argument thing from the, from the Airflow uh, operator. And these are, we will look at all the kind of, mo at least most of the, the script, and these are what people configure usually. So it was, yeah, you, you probably have seen this uh, many times, so things like num executors, zero memory, driver memory, core, and then overheads. And how do we, so, and yeah, this is, uh, this really is something, the end result that we find is, is actually very fairly simple. We try several things, like uh, we try, for example, actually manually accounting uh, how many nodes will each container take. If, if, if let's say one node is one container, sometimes we try to group things together. And the, and the solution was pretty simple. We just match the total, um, we just make sure that the total number of memory, the total amount of memory and the total number of vCores actually match the, request, uh, the one that's requested by the script. So for example, if your script is asking, asking for 10 executors, 6 gigabyte memory, at least the end result is, uh, the end result is 60 gigabyte <coughs> total. For example, it could be, I don't know, 12 gigs times 5, it could be, uh, yeah, just, just, we're just matching the total. And we choose the instance type with minimum price because it, it could be, uh, there are several. There are a lot of uh, instance type that are available, which is the one with minimum price. And then, in case uh, there are several with several set up with the same price, we choose uh, the least number of instances. Just like we'd rather have like a, a larger, uh, but like fewer instances, just to reduce like network shuffling. And for a few cases, there are actually really few that uh, that we need to handle manually. Then, yeah, we we define and tune as needed. Right, so that's the, the whole um, cluster sizing part. And again, I, I mentioned one thing uh, that we want to set, that we want to do is to make the ETL cost more transparent. And it's pretty straightforward to do if you're uh, using Databrook, you can just label, you can just label things. And it will, this will be available in the building data so you can like slice and dice how much uh, this thing costs if you're uh, slicing if you're choosing things uh, from like a certain script name. So these are just the some some labels that we apply. Things like is backfill. Backfill is we can, we thought it's important to label backfill because sometimes when you're backfilling you get like a sudden spike in cost and you want to be able to explain that. And things like script name, uh, what what product does this belong to, uh, environment, things like that. Um, yeah, and then after you label things, then you can just build this kind of dashboard on top of a building data. Uh, what what script name costs how much for how long? So I'm sorry that we need to block this one. I think. Yeah, it's mostly blocked, yeah, but you just way. imagine it's something. This way. Yeah. Yeah, so basically, the idea is to have like a, a certain allocation that basically in this certain use case, how much it costs. We want to have that kind of data. Right. And so far, it's quite hard to get that kind of things, even though for like custom maintenance so requirements. That basically, one time, how much it costs. We can. On the back end, you can set attribution on each business unit specifically. We know precisely this business unit how much it costs from the processing specifically. Whether it's actually profitable or not, whether it's doing good thing or not. We're trying to basically just put the data, let everybody take a look at it. Great. Okay. And like a little bit of review, how's it going so far? It's it's overall been working really well. 
uh, the data broke cost was really only 20 to 25 percent uh, of the cost of this fixed size cluster. Um, yeah, one thing uh, you know that our data is in S3 and our uh, processing cluster is in GCP. Um, we didn't really, we know there's going to be some data transfer costs, but turn out it really is not negligible. So just, it still is a saving in the end because that was like a huge factor, the 20%. But yeah, if you are ever wanted to do like a cross cloud um, processing, you might want to like, uh, just so that you're not surprised. And how many cluster you can spawn is still bounded by some GCP quotas, things like what's the, num the number of GCE, yeah, GCE instance per project you can spawn, how many API calls can you make to the specific endpoint in like per second or per day. So you, you, you still have to kind of turtle it somewhere, not just spawning infinitely. <coughs> All right, that, that concludes the ETL part of the presentation. I'm gonna pass this along to Andre. Yep, okay. Uh. Can you pass me the laptops? Oops. Oops. Oh, do you want to switch, please? Oh, yeah, sure, sure. Uh, can you help this? Uh, to so, yeah, uh, thank you, Mishara, for... So, yeah, I'm gonna touch it here. Okay, nice. So yeah, thanks Ms. Rina for explaining all our uh, Spark processing environment from our self-managed to a transient data proc uh, clusters. So now comes the Databricks era. So uh, please wait a second. Okay, so basically in Databricks, we basically do two things. So one, notebook environment, where we, where we do all the data explorations there, and the second, scheduled ETL jobs. So basically, um, having using Databricks, Databricks comes with a lot of uh, advantage. For example, it's basically it's very easy to use. Basically, you have a code in your note notebook environment. You have a Spark. Uh, you can spawn a Spark clusters. You can attach the notebook environment in the Spark clusters, and voila, you can run it. It's very seamless. And also, there's a scheduler, scheduler on top of it as well. And there's a lot of us useful features in data Databricks, such as auto scalings, where you can auto scale your uh, your Spark clusters. And there's also a secrets features where you can store and retrieve your secrets safely without having to expose uh, sensitive information in the, your code. And yeah, easy monitoring and logging as well. Everything is embedded in the UI and it's very rich. So uh, having said that, there's uh, some numbers drawbacks as well. For example, right now there's no straightforward connections to GCP. So yeah, I mean, connecting to GCP environment is not that easy and it requires a lot of manual interventions. And there's no custom default template when spawning in clusters. I will explain that later on. And also, it's not so easy to monitor the cost of our usage as well. I'll explain that later on as well. So here, um, yeah, we have our, our fair, sh uh, fair share of challenge of using Databricks. Uh, some of them are, first, picking a suitable cluster configurations. So um, basically, mo uh, lots of people, they care about the uh, logics they want to solve. They, they care about like, business problems. They care about getting things done. However, some of them, they might not know how to tune the clusters for their workload. Then how would they choose their cluster workload then? So this is the default page when I, saw, when I, when I want to spawn a cluster for my job. So basically, this is the first thing that I saw. And some of the properties here is not preferable for our generalized use cases. And in our opinion, it can, it can be optimized uh, better. But however, some people who don't know how to tune their workload, they just choose these default configurations. And yeah, we can't, we, basically we can't control what people see when they open this page. And yeah, we wish we do. And yeah, our solutions on this is that we provide some documentations, some basic documentation for people who don't know how to tune their workload, some, some best practice use cases, for example, a, enabling Databricks auto-scaling features, like whether you have to spawn a few big clusters versus uh, small numerous clusters, uh, mixing, uh, mixing uh, AWS spot instances with on-demand instances, because Databricks has that features where you can use the spot instances and you can fall back when on-demand um, in case the, uh, the spot instances get reclaimed by AWS. 
And also, you can, yeah, please use dedicated cluster for scheduled jobs so you have no dependency hell. So our second challenge was, yeah, there's limited features on cost monitoring in our opinion. So this is the <coughs> graph uh, provided by Databricks to us. Then, yeah, having, lo looking at this graph, it's not really apparent how to see things like, how is our uh, usage on a certain period of time? Then, yeah, our, um, I believe that some information can be added here and the visualization can be made better as well. So our solutions here was uh, we create a custom dashboard. So basically, we, we, are, we are pulling like uh, some API from AWS, from Databricks as well, and we made our own dashboards. So here, instead of uh, using a, a metric such as DBUs, we use a, met, a real money spent here. And on top of Databricks cost, we also included our AWS cost as an infrastructure cost as well. So we really know how much we spent on a specific project, specific business unit, or a specific team. So our third challenge is, yeah, unfortunately, we still find uh, bare secrets in notebooks. Bare secrets as in password, API key in notebook is not really aligned to our, to our security best practices. So what's our solutions for this? So secret scanning. So we have a secret scanning pipeline where we, where we periodically scanned the, um, not our notebook environment for these bare strings, for, for these uh, bare secrets. Then we put up in a dashboard for in our internal dashboard for people to see and fix them. Yeah, but unfortunately, I can't show you guys the dashboard here because it contains some yeah. sensitive information. We prefer not to choose it. We prefer not to <laughs> share it. Do, do, you export, do you export notebooks somewhere first and then you import or you, you git commit them or how do you scan? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, so our takeaway of using Databricks is that. Oh, by the way, um, this is secret scanning. It's not just for Databricks oh. notebook. Yeah. So everything in our content is secret. So we, we, we keep track of history of like, this is the biggest offender or something like that. This is, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know how it works, right? If you work collaboratively, you need to send an announcement to everyone. So like everyone. <coughs> okay. Yep, okay, so I'll continue. So here, yeah, having using Databricks, um, some of our takeaways of using Databricks are Databricks is, in our opinion, is very excellent Spark framework. And it's very easy to use. Basically, you just have to uh, get your own notebook, uh, write the code there, explore there, then just um, plug into the uh, Spark clusters and just run it. And it has a lot of fantastic inbuilt features such as auto scalings, secrets, and also a uh, falling, falling from spot instances to on-demand instances. It helped us to uh, cost cutting. And yeah, easy logging on monitoring as well. It's a, lot, a lot of it are embedded in the UI. And yeah, in our opinion, some features can be made better. For example, like as, as I've shared before, cost monitoring and cluster spec enforcement. And also, yeah, we hope for a better GCP integration. So here, um, so our current ETL lifecycle in Databricks is that um, we do a data exploration in the notebook. We, we, we do our development there. Then once we are confident that we can get a result that we want, basically we put a scheduler on top of it, then that's become our production environment. Uh, however, as we grow our engineering expertise, we believe that this process can be made better. And since we are moving our infrastructure to GCP, so yeah, we, we made our own in-house in frameworks to tackle this issue. So introducing RS. RS is our, what's RS? Basically RS is our code name for our in-house general Spark Simulation framework in GCP. It's leveraging lots of GCP technologies such as Cloud Composers and Cloud Data Proc, which is basically Airflow and Spark managed in GCP. And yeah, our core focus here, I want to emphasize this, is to maintain a simplicity for our users without compromising on engineering quality. And yeah, we want everything on GitHub for better transparency and we can monitor how the code evolves. So some of the key components of our frameworks are scheduler, execution engine, CI-CD pipeline, a secret management in the form of an SDK where people can plug in, use it, they can store and retrieve a feature safely, kind of like Databricks secrets that I have mentioned before. And also we have a CLI wrapper where, where users can use it to interact with the whole systems. And yeah, this is the whole architecture of our, our framework here. So basically, as you can see here, 
users uh, use the CLI to interact with the whole systems. The beauty of this part is that they don't have to know about this part. So basically, it's abstracted from them uh, by the CLI. They just have to uh, fire a, co uh, a few commands in the CLI to interact with the components there. So basically, what they need to do is just they, they, they write their ETL jobs, they submit it to the upstream repo, then once the upstream repo in GitHub uh, receive their code, CICD will kick in, all do all the necessary jobs, putting all the files in necessary places, and the scaler will, will pick it and do the job. So yeah, this, well, I mean, it's kind of like engineering diagram, but I, will, I want to talk about user point of view. So here in user point of view, the system is very simple. Like, they only need to care about few things, their ETL jobs with the dependencies, and also the dependen a list of dependencies, like for example, uh, Python packages in the form of uh, requirements files, and also uh, user configurations, how they want to run the jobs uh, in the YAML configurations. Then basically, they just have to fire, uh, fire up this component through the CLI, and the CLI will, will transfer all of this, activate it, uh, push this into the systems, and their ETL will be in production in no time. So yeah, talking about user configurations here. So this is the user configurations. It's like they, they just have to pass the systems, like in a YAML format, how they want to run the jobs. For example, the schedule, cron schedule, like the machine type, number of workers, for example, uh, how, many, how many Spark workers you want to have, like owner email in case you want to be notified if the, if, uh, if the job fails. And yeah, lots of, and there's a lot of it. And basically the system will parse these YAML configurations it will transform them into an airflow deck, and it, so it, it can be interpreted by the scheduler to run the job. So yeah, some of our highlight here, features highlight are that a secret management in the form of SDK, whereas, yeah, I, I have explained before, where you can store and retrieve your secrets safely, and there's a permission isolation as well. So in this framework, each of the job has its own sets of permissions, what it can do, what it cannot do. And the CI/CD pipeline and uh, the scheduler have their own permission as well. So we also provide a backfill capability. We have a CL abstractions where people can use it to interact with the whole system without knowing the implementation. Also GitHub, yeah. We want everything to be checked in GitHub. So yeah, it's provide a better transparency. We know how the code evolves. And ownership attribution as well, yeah. Kind of, uh, kind of uh, same thing as, as what Ninas does. So basically, we label everything, we label every resources, so that we know how much we really spend, how much our usage on a certain business unit, certain projects, on a certain team. And yeah, having said that, we still believe that there's still lots of improvement to be made. It's still far from perfect. And, yeah, and we are still continue to working on, on this to make this better. And yeah, that wraps up, wraps up our stories in using Databricks and building our own solution in GCP. So yeah, I will pass it to Didi. All right, cool. Just gonna hold it like this. Uh, thank you very much for Nina and Andres. I mean, I think that's pretty much the journey and history that we have right now. I mean, because of the times, the presentation that we're trying to present is just, we're trying to make it touching a certain things, just give a hint on what kind of complexity, but we cannot deep dive. Because for example, it's like one section can, we can have discussion for two days, three days, or the whole week, but how it's being done, how's the detail, and blah, 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 blah. So um, I think the next step would be a bit of Q&A in case any of you would like to ask some things. Go ahead, I guess. Yes. I saw in your architecture diagram that you are using Goblin after Kafka. What exactly is the reason for using Goblin there? Can't we just uh, use Kafka consumers instead of using Goblin? Um, so, I mean, the question is like on the first slide, uh, there's a need to use Goblin and then Kafka instead of directly to Kafka, right? Yeah, sure. I guess it's kind of give it to you. The 2016 and 2019 slide. By the way, I haven't traveled by that time. It's just a question. Okay. <laughs> so uh, Kafka is where we send our tracking data. And Goblin is, um, yeah, I, I think um, I, I think your question is why not like a, a custom Kafka customer? 
consumer. Yeah, just use Kafka consumer Excel, multiple of them. Right. Um, j just for simplicity, I guess, I mean, Goblin is exactly, is Kafka consumers, they're built exactly for this kind of, you know, pulling things from Kafka and then dumping it into, into like a nicely time kind of folder uh, structure in S3. So yeah, j j just for simplicity. Any other question? Yeah, I questions. Keep on repeating them. Can I ask a question? Uh, uh, you know, uh, hey, more of like, so if you're talking about cross-cloud connectivity, like, you know, one of the challenges you mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, the incubation is a bit cloud. Uh, do you guys have use cases where you do joint computation across two cloud data sets, like something coming from S3, something is coming from GCS? Uh, yes. Do, do I mean, you mean like uh, somebody trying to do join the data from the GCP and also from the AWS? Uh, yes, actually, it happened many times. Um, let me repeat the question first. So I'm still holding my cup because some breakfast sticks. So yeah, and there are a number of cases in which basically, okay, the data is not on the P, uh, GCP yet and we need to pull something from AWS, and then we need to join both of them. Uh, we have the flexibility to do so. Basically, pretty much all the platform that we have right now, whatever three, four things, uh, we have to be able to do so. So also the main reason we have secret management here, so basically to ensure that the whole platform can access data from the S3 as well. So regardless of the location, you should be able to pull this data from here and then join the data from there and just mix it together. I think hopefully that answer your questions. Yep, I think mean, that's what I mean. That's an interesting dimension when somebody is using multiple clouds. Uh, another question I find a lot uh, I don't want to block other people if there are other questions I can go in. Okay, go go. Okay, so uh, my uh, next question, I think you mentioned about the challenge where you don't have to control like how people are configuring cluster. So is it like uh, for individual workloads you're creating separate cluster every time or how does that deployment model look? Uh, in which area, by the way? So I think uh, you're talking about the cost uh, governance or whatever, cost control mm. is one dimension, which is one of the challenges you mentioned. So it's cost and tempo itself. Data <laughs> yeah, it breaks. So yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, I think what we're trying to do is we're trying to empower people with a certain magic within their fingertips, right? Uh, first of all, so we'd like to solve a problems and we trust our people up to a certain point, but we cannot lock them first. We need to trust them first and then move forwards, right? So it means like, uh, for example, uh, by having like a Databricks and cue balls, we give people power to create, okay, I think we trust you, you can create cluster as much as you want based on your workload, we just need to train you better. Uh, some people doing that religiously, some people are doing that kind of like, a, you know, because time frame, whatever that things, I just wanna get it done and offer with something like that. So it comes with a certain consequences that basically without having a flexibility to enforce that along the way, and then people doing a cross check, people not doing a cross checks, uh, it will make people having some sort of like a, a bit kind of like a lazy perspective. Oh, you know what? I can do it all the time, something like that. Traveloka, we, we work in much kind of like a small independent teams and we give um, people and we give them a flexibility to do, look, we trust you, do as much as you want, but please be mindful. This is why, one of like on the key take on all our system is basically making sure we have a proper attribution, right? Is it something that basically from, I don't know, one to two years ago, we decided that basically, look, we need to empower users, but we need to make sure that people are responsible. The easiest way is basically attribute them with what? Money. Money is the easy numbers. Everybody understand basically $100 is $100. Having that kind of thing, basically making sure our life is sure as a person that manages the platform that basically, look, we give you powers and then people say like, okay, this is how much you spend and then basically, oh, is this fair enough? People can adjust it accordingly. Hopefully that answer your question. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Anytime. Anything else?
I mean, uh, I'm trying to be mindful with the timing here. That's all right. We started like about 10 minutes in, so it's, it's fair enough for another 10, 10, 12, 15 minutes. Is okay. Yes, sir. Can you elaborate again? Uh, so when you have 300 PT something jobs, right? Uh, and uh, sometimes they start simultaneously, right? Some of them need one core, 20 gigabytes, 20 cores, 30 gigabytes of memory. It all runs in, uh, in each job runs in, not in an independent cluster, right? Sometimes they run in the same cluster. How, how it works? Uh, I think the, yeah. the, the first question was kind of there. Uh, when two jobs go to the same cluster, mm -hmm. how do you know, how do you, how do you split the AWS clusters? Okay. Uh, Okay, the question is like, um, when you you have like a number of jobs, hundreds of jobs, I think I would, I, I think I think your question is more towards the self-managed cluster on the first one. Uh, well, your current on the current architecture. Okay, the current architectures is actually, uh, on, you know what? It's much. Nina want to answer that actually. He, she's kind of eager, so just give it to her. Right. So in the current architecture, we spawn a new cluster for every execution. So if there are 350 uh, running daily, there are 250 cluster spawn that they running things and then uh, turn off exactly after they're done. Is that all thanks to Ansible? Um, Ansible is more essential in our previous, um, in our previous uh, kind of setup. The current setup was simply a Python API call. We, we just call it like Dataproc. Dataproc got, got this um, API that we can Call to when we want to submit. Uh, no, when we want to spawn a cluster with certain spec, mm -hmm. we can just call the API, wait until it's completed, and then we know the endpoint, and then that's what we use to gain call another API that submit jobs. Like the Ansible one is more to provision things when we were managing it in the, uh, we were managing it alone. Can you do the same with the Databricks? Do you run a separate cluster in Databricks for your job as well? I. Think so. You want to answer that? Oh, sorry again. Do you run a separate cluster for every job uh, in Databricks as well? Well, actually, for our scheduled jobs, yes, we do. Uh, we do spawn a new automated cluster job, but for uh, for our uh, EDA for our EDA purposes, we do uh, spawn an interactive cluster for all the people to use it. Yeah. Is that answer your question? Yeah. 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 Okay. So then the Question: do you, do you see there is a, a lower utilization of each cluster? Because every cluster is some overhead, right? Uh, so do you, do you see an opportunity in uh, squeezing jobs into the same cluster simultaneously, or does it make sense? Uh, well, actually, uh, some of the reasons we do use a uh, different class, uh, a new cluster for a scheduled job, is because uh, first, uh, yeah, we don't we don't want any dependency hell. So that uh, each each of uh, each of them have their own environment, kind of like a Kubernetes environment. So yeah, they they, they won't they won't uh, the dependencies won't, won't battle with each other. So and second things, yeah. Um, some sometimes we do we will have a trial and error. For example, a for for a job we do not know like uh, uh, at first we do not we don't know how much resources we will it use. Then we, we do a trial run, for example. Then we look at, uh, I mentioned before, like the logging and monitoring is very easy. So we do at the, at the some, some monitoring and log, uh, monitoring there, like uh, CPU usages and, uh, and memory usage. And we, uh, we do tune the cluster based on that. Yeah, and the third thing is because Databricks provides a much lower cost for scaled jobs rather than interactive clusters. So yeah, that's our agreement. Okay. If you want to tap on, like, I don't want to interrupt, but if you want to tap on uh, knowledge about uh, Databricks, there are two, three, there's like oversubscribed room of s solutions architects of Databricks today. Uh, two of them wear uh, Databricks t-shirts, and I don't know why it's here, so if you need to, like, catch us later offline, we'll talk about instance pools, cluster profiles, how do we differ from yarn clusters, what not. Yeah, we have another five, six, seven minutes. It's already one. Yeah, one uh, question. Um, you talked about moving from AWS to uh, Google uh, Cloud, right? And uh, I find that very interesting. So, what uh, apart from layer like 
this transient uh, spinning up and spinning up down of clusters and uh, what what were the other factors because you are moving a lot of other stuff to google cloud as well so can you please highlight the different factors you think um, because it's a big decision right so, yes uh, it's a big decision um I cannot explain end to end in detail in this kind of forums, but I guess um, there are a number of key factors in deciding what kind of platform that you have. Um, our decision that being made at that time might not be suitable with your decision that need to be made right now. I'm a big believer in that basically, as long as you do your best at any given point in times, you won't make any regrets. Okay. So at around 2017, I guess, like uh, we realized that basically if we would like to rebuild everything, I mean, um, our system in AWS, for example, uh, there are a number of things that we have to build from the scratch. And the propositions from the GCP at that time is much more compelling. Uh, another key factor would be, for example, select on the BigQuery. BigQuery is really, really comparing, for example. Nowadays, the competition is quite tough, right? The Redshift, Redshift Spectrums, Azure, for example. And um, we try with a few things, um, but we feel that basically when we're trying to rebuild stuff on the GCP with whatever thing that they have right now, for a certain stack and certain use case, it much more makes sense. And perhaps it brings us a certain benefit compared to AWS or compared to others. I mean, I cannot disclose right now what kind of things, when are they and stuff like that, but uh, we still have a number of like a presence in AWS, for example, strikes. And if we feel that basically in that use case is much more suitable in AWS, I say like, let's stick with it. We are quite practical. And we keep evaluating on what happened on the market right now. Because we live on a very interesting world. Things are changing every, I don't know, month, I guess, or perhaps three months. And then if we found that basically, hey, you know what? This is sounds suitable for us. And after we do like our due diligence, it gives us much more benefit. Let's say, why not? I guess our decision might be different compared to your company or your organization. So um, the variable are quite a lot here. So the point here is like for a certain use case that we have right now, it is much more suitable to build it on the GCP rather than on the AWS. Uh, for a certain use case in which basically still, basically uh, good in AWS, we just stick as it is. That's what a business is. Hopefully, in the answer your question. Okay. All right. Thank you. Anytime. Anything else? I guess. No. I guess. So we, we might take a yeah. Let's take a five minute break. All right. If you guys want to stretch your legs, um, have a coffee. Um, second part uh, will be about Delta announcements uh, that came from Spark AI Summit. And uh, yeah, so if you need any more information, just get us. Yeah, I mean, uh, we're going to be mingling around here in case you would like to ask something and stuff like that. 